the sun shines over Lhasa. Standing on the roof of the world, Lhasa, capital of the Tibet Autonomous Region, has a history of more than 1,300 years. The Patalma Palace is one of the most ancient architectural masterpieces in Tibet. Renowned as a city of sunlight, Lhasa is bright and clear the year round. But darkness ruled under centuries of feudal serfdom. It is only today, in the great socialist era, that Lhasa truly enjoys the bright sunshine and the beauties of spring. New buildings and factories by the scores bedeck this ancient city. There was no modern industry whatever in Lhasa before liberation. Today the city has nearly 30 modern factories as is emerging apace. Power, coal, machinery, construction material, chemical and textile industries have appeared in Lhasa for the first time in history. Emancipated carpet weavers working on carpets with elegant designs. The emancipated serfs handle everything from traditional handicrafts to electronics. These products were all manufactured by Lhasa workers. Old Lhasa had to depend on supplies from outside, even for such simple things as a nail or a box of matches. are doing wonders on land previously occupied by the three major estate owners in Tibet, namely local officials, the monasteries, and the nobles. 
The outskirts of Lhasa is 3,800 to 4,100 meters above sea level. But here, winter wheat gives high yield over wide areas. In 1974, Lhasa, as well as the entire Tibet Autonomous Region, achieved self-sufficiency in grain. Tibetan herdsmen were nothing but talking animals to the feudal herd owners. Today, their joyful songs resound in the vast pasture lands of the people's communes. Are harvesting apples they cultivated themselves. The fruit was considered a rare delicacy in Tibet before liberation. keep the emancipated serfs well supplied. In 1974, the volume of sales per day of daily necessities increased by 74% as compared with 1965. beggars of the past have become their own masters. Life is affluent, but memory of the bitter past is something they will never forget. Many just roam the streets and beg for a living. In old Lhasa, there were 7,000 beggars to a population of a little more than 30,000. Many lived in tattered tents. Starving children and dogs scrambled for food left over by the rich. They crushed bones for the marrow while their own marrow had been sucked dry by the insatiable big estate owners. treated worse than beasts of burden, and worked like one. But 
the load they were forced to carry at the behest of big reactionary estate owners with Dali as their chief, weighed upon them like a mountain. The dark, feudal serfdom collapsed at last. With tremendous revolutionary zeal, the emancipated serfs are building a socialist new Lhasa on the ruins of the old society. Through the great proletarian cultural revolution, the city's industry and agriculture underwent an even more vigorous development. And here, the construction of a modern big power plant is in full swing day and night. Construction is underway everywhere, and everywhere one senses the vigorous enthusiasm. The floor space that has come up in Lhasa since liberation is ten times the figure on the eve of liberation. The city now spreads itself over more than ten square kilometers, instead of its former size of 1.5 square kilometers. Another new asphalt road is being paved. There was not an inch of asphalt road in Lhasa before. Now, there are nine good asphalt avenues. The new roads are referred to as roads leading to happiness. The Narchin hydropower station, built after liberation, is called the Palace of Light. Power supply has more than trebled in the ten years since the founding of the Tibet Autonomous Region. Secretary of the Nanjing Hydropower Station Party Committee and member of the Tibet Autonomous Regional Party Committee had grazed cattle for a feudal herd owner as a boy and suffered miserably in the past. He has now assumed a responsible and leading position. He used to be illiterate. Now he reads books and newspapers in both the Tibetan and Han languages, and spends a great deal of time in conscientiously studying Marxist-Leninist classics and writings by Chairman Mao. Jiang Tuo's fellow workers praise him as a good carter who is one with the masses and who never separates himself from productive labor. Ang Gong, who leads a team of mechanics at the Ngachin hydropower station, successfully improved a leak-proof device on the turbine, which raised generating capacity from 1,000 kilowatts to 1,350 kilowatts. to the Lhasa July 21st Workers' College. It is called July 21st because on this day in 1968, Chairman Mao issued a directive on educational revolution which states that college students should be selected from among workers and peasants with practical experience and they should return to production after a few years. 
The party and state ensure the labouring people the right to receive an education. They also see to it that the labouring people get proper health care. The Lhasa Municipal People's Hospital is one of the city's four modern hospitals. The days when health and medical care was inaccessible to the serfs are gone forever. Infants are nicely tucked away in cradles, unlike their parents who were born in livestock sheds. Dr. Wang Li Zhu, a surgeon of the Han nationality, treats her patients with meticulous care. She and the Tibetan doctor, Wang Jitiren, have been colleagues for many years. Dr. Wang Li Zhu comes from Jiangxi province. After she graduated from a medical college in 1955, she came to Tibet on her own initiative and has been here for 20 years. For her affectionate kinship with the Tibetan people, she is acclaimed as a good doctor sent by Chairman Mao. Wang Jichiren is the son of a peasant. He joined the revolutionary ranks when he was very young. Later, the party sent him to Xi'an to be trained as a surgeon. The two surgeons consulting each other for the next operation. common cause and common profession bind the two families intimately together. generations experience completely different childhoods. These youngsters of New Lhasa will never scramble for dinner leftovers with dogs. Today, nearly 10,000 Tibetan children go to scores of primary schools in Lhasa. This is in sharp contrast to the old days, when Lhasa only had two primary schools 
enrolling less than 300 pupils, and they were the sons and daughters of the nobility. The city also has middle schools, secondary technical schools, July 21st workers' colleges, and a normal school. Youngsters who have no idea of the dark old society are listening to the experience of Gala, an emancipated serf, and her bitter accusation. She says, I was a slave before liberation. My husband, Danzen Wangju, was a tailor serving an estate owner who gave him two ounces of coarse bread a day. We had to beg to stay alive. One day, the estate owner came to get my husband to work. I was about to have a baby, so I asked him to excuse my husband. But no sooner had I finished than the estate owner called in some bullies. They stripped off my clothes, bound me to a pillar, and let loose a pack of dogs to bite me. The dogs tore my abdomen and wounded the child inside. The child has grown up, but there is still a scar on his head. It was not until after the democratic reform in Tibet in 1959 that my family began to enjoy a happy life. There are 12 in our family, nine have jobs, Two of the children go to school, and a little grandson. I am the grandmother. We have plenty to eat and wear, and we have money to deposit in the bank every month. All these we owe to the Communist Party and Chairman Mao. On this particular day, a letter and a photograph arrived from their youngest daughter, Dawa, who is studying finance at the head office of the People's Bank of China in Peking. Their eldest son, Lo Sang Xirao, is a cutter in the People's Liberation Army. The second daughter, Chiangba, is a hairdresser. The fourth son, Yundan, and his wife are both workers. The fifth son, Chungda, studies at the Lhasa Middle School. Today, Lhasa belongs to the laboring people. Norbu Linka, private residence of the rebel chief Dalai and formerly out of bounds to the laboring people, has been turned into a people's park. And here is Danjin Wangju's family again. The father and son drink to the new life.
their grandson is also having a good time. Only those who have been through darkness can appreciate the warmth of light. Only those who have been oppressed know the bliss of emancipation. The children may sing and dance as much as they like. The evil fueled serfdom is gone. The misery of the past is gone. Let us sing and dance. We'll never live like beasts of burden again. We'll never suffer from cold and hunger again. We'll smash the shackles a millennium. We're slaves no more. Today, we are the masters of New Lhasa. We are the masters of New Tibet. to your heart's content. The brilliance of Chairman Mao illuminates the hearts of the emancipated serfs. The sun of socialism shines in Tibet and Lhasa.